On November 9, 1847, a civil engineer named Charles Ellett Jr. was commissioned to build a bridge across the Niagara Gorge. The question was, when, where, and how do you even get the first cable across an 825 foot chasm with 225 foot cliffs on both sides? This is where Theodore Grace Ellett, a local iron worker, came in with his brilliant idea. The idea? A kite flying contest. And you might wonder what kites and bridges have to do with one another. Enter the day of the contest. A local 15 year old boy won the $10 cash prize by flying a kite across the chasm across the gorge. The next day, they took that kite and they tied to the end of it a rope. And to the end of the rope, they tied a cable of 36 strands of 10 gauge wire. And that became the first piece of the first railway suspension bridge that would support a 170 ton locomotive. And it was the, a kite was the first step in crossing the Niagara Gorge. What I love about this story is it illustrates really how the little things in life can lead to very big things. Most of us are cultured to dismiss and downplay the small things while over-exaggerating the big things. And what I believe is that when we commit ourselves to doing small things as if they were big things, God will do big things as if they were small. We're in a series right now called Win the Day, looking at seven habits that lead us to live a more faithful life in Christ. We started by looking at the first habit, which was flip the script and then kiss the wave. And last week it was eat the frog, leveraging small habits that would send us and propel us to a life well lived. I think it's easy for us to downplay the small things and put them off as if they're not important. You know, I hear some people say that I'll be generous when I have more or make more money. And I just don't buy it. That generosity is our, our choice and we choose to be generous with what we have or we choose not to. Some people will say, I will serve more when I have more time. And the one thing that we know is that we'll never find time. We have to make time. And so service because becomes something we either sacrifice and make time for, or we don't. And some people will say, I'll step up when the right big opportunity arises. I think some of us are still waiting for that big opportunity when we could be faithfully stewarding the small opportunities that God gives us consistently. Luke 16, 10 records Jesus saying this, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. You see, there really isn't this correlation that we'll give more when we have more or we'll do more when we have more time or, or we'll do a big thing when it comes up if we won't do the small thing while it's here, you see the correlation that Jesus says is that if we do the small things and we can be trusted with the small daily things of life, we can be trusted with the big ones as well. We're going to be looking at a story in the Old Testament on the front end of this sermon this week. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah is found in one of the, as one of the minor prophets. And you see, Zechariah... It is part of a two-fold story of the return from exile. The first one is found in Nehemiah. Nehemiah comes back and he is commissioned with rebuilding the wall around the city of Jerusalem. 
And now that that's built, Zechariah is now commissioned with building, with rebuilding the temple. You see, when the Babylonians took the, the city of Jerusalem and the kingdom of Judah, of the Israelites, to, to captivity, they tore down the walls and they destroyed the temple. And so now, as God's people returns, these two have been commissioned with the works to rebuild both. And so if you're with me in Zechariah, it starts this way, chapter 4, verse 6. It says, So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. You see, God has given a word to Zechariah for Zerubbabel, who will lead the people in rebuilding the temple. And he says this, he says, this is the word, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. God has given a word to Zechariah for Zerubbabel. He says, you're going to rebuild the temple. He says, but not by might or by power, but by my spirit, declares the Lord. You see, the Bible also puts it this way, unless... Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. See, the Spirit of God is at work at our work. You see, without the Spirit in our lives, there's a lot that we can't do. But with the Spirit, anything is possible. Imagine this. The day of Pentecost, the disciples are gathered in the room Imagine they had prayed and the Spirit had never come on them. And do you think if Peter had stepped up to preach that same sermon, that he could have made a crowd with 3,000 people choose to follow Jesus on his own? I don't think so. You see, I think God is doing incredible work and that with his, and at work with his Spirit in us, he can do things that can't even be measured. And it's not by our power but by his. Another way I could say this is I believe that God wants to do more in our lives and in the life of our church that is beyond our ability, beyond our resources, and beyond our greatest imagination. And that he'll do it all for the better of his kingdom and for his glory. And it will be impossible without him. Zechariah 4, 7. What are you, mighty mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become level ground. God is taking this, this obstacle. Let, let's face it, it's an obstacle. You see, the first temple was built by Solomon, and it was funded through uh, many different ways, and it was incredible. And that was the measurement for the Israelites of what would have to be achieved. But what they see before them is probably what looks like a mountain of rubble. What remains of the first and original temple in Jerusalem. And now somehow they have to take this mighty mountain of an obstacle, rebuilding the temple, finding the funds for it, and getting the work done, all after moving everything that remains. And one thing that we know from both of these twofold stories is that the Israelites really had a hard time imagining how this could be redone. And God says, you have to understand, even the mighty mountain, you'll have to tell it, will become level ground. And here's what I think is important. One, if we're going to see God do more in us, through us, it's beyond our ability and our resource and our imagination, we have to step up to the plate and be willing to stop letting obstacles become our ending point but our starting point. 
Remember the second habit, kiss the wave. We really have to understand that the obstacle in front of us isn't really a deterrent. It's the way forward. God is often delivering us through the obstacles, not around them. And so sometimes we have to step up and flip the script as well and stop telling the obstacles in front of us to God. We have to come to a point where we stop telling God about how hard the things are in front of us, but come to a point where we look at the obstacle and remember and declare how great our God is. And the second that it tells me is this, that if we're going to see more done beyond our ability and our resource and our imagination, it starts with godly leaders. It starts with godly leaders who will courageously and boldly step up to the plate and tell our obstacles about the power of our God. It starts with godly leaders who realize that God's resources are infinite, even though ours are not. It starts with godly leaders who step up to the plate and declare these things so that the people who follow will see the power of God at work. Without godly leaders who remember the grace, the mercy, and the power of God that God has over this world, though we don't disregard the facts and often face brutal reality, but we do these with a sense of purpose and conviction driven by the Spirit of God for His glory and the edification of His kingdom. Simply put, for the church to do more and greater than our imagination, it starts with godly leaders. And this is exactly what Zechariah does. He's given this word for Zerubbabel, who will go and lead the people to do this great task for God's people. And the prophet reminds the worker that what is a mighty mountain in your way other than the way forward? You see, some of us, I think, in the next year, we will face even greater obstacles than we faced this year. You might ask, how can it get much harder than a pandemic like this one? Well, what we know and what we've been proven is that Nothing, nothing is going to get easier. Some of us will face more anxiety, more depression. We'll be diagnosed with another disease or ailment. Unrest will continue in our hearts and sometimes even in our communities. And for some of us, we may not even just face a mountain. We'll face what seems like a range of of mountains and will be challenged like never before to remember and learn what it means to kiss the wave that throws us or casts us upon the rock of ages. But I want us to remember that the scripture is full of obstacles that were overturned by a mighty God. That a sea can become a sidewalk, that a sun can stand still, that a man can a man's plans can be thwarted by a talking donkey that kingdoms can fall and even water reservoirs can turn into tanks of wine. The truth is we will never be able in our lifetime to have a testimony if we don't first walk through the first four letters, which is the test. We'll never be refined if we never go through the fire. And if we want to fly the kite, we have to start with the small. It'll be like raising a banner. It starts with the single first kite string. And when the wave is kissed, eventually the test will become the testimony. I love it. The NLT uh, says this verse like this. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone of the temple in place, the people will shout, may God bless it, may God bless it. 
See, I love this story of Zechariah because if we're if we look really closely, we see three habits right here all together. We see flipping the script, which means telling the obstacle about the presence and the power of our God. What is a mighty mountain? Except something that God can level. It's kissing the wave because we understand that God doesn't always deliver us through, around the obstacle, but through the obstacle. Sometimes we go through the refiner's fire and we eat the frog when we face what lies before us and do the hard things that get us to the end. You see, they understood that building the temple would be one of the hardest tasks they would do. But every time you move a rock and you prepare the level ground and you build one stone on top of another, you're eating the frog. And I believe this is where faith grows. All of this over and over is where faith is stretched and refined, just like a muscle when lifting a weight is stretched and becomes larger. You know, I've learned that some people who go through a test that come out with a testimony, often that testimony is a better vision for the future. That when their faith is stretched and they come out the other side, they're given a vision in their heart for how life in Christ can be better, not just for them, but for others around them. A vision for how things should be, about how heaven on earth looks. And rebuilding the temple of God for the Israelites looks like a mountain of a task. The finished product will lead to the victory and the people shouting the praise of God. And I want to skip down now to verse 10 in Zechariah 4. And I love this because it says this, Do not despise the day of small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. A plumb line was an ancient form of a level. It's how you kept a wall aligned. And God says, the people will shout joy and praise when the final stone is set on top. But listen, the Lord does not despise the day of small beginnings. No, you see, the Lord is full of joy when he sees the plumb line placed in the hand of of Zerubbabel. I love it because one pastor said it this way, that God isn't always great because nothing is too big. Sometimes God's great just because nothing is too small. And we come full circle because we have to remember that sometimes we do the small things often enough that God will show us the big things. We don't despise the days of small beginnings. Many of you have read the Bible all the way through more than once. And how did you start? Did you read the entire Bible in one sitting? Or did you one day decide that you were going to read the scriptures and you read a few verses and another few verses, and a couple of chapters, became a couple of books, became the Bible? We don't despise the days of small beginnings. But we do them over and over until those small things become big things. The small victories become big victories. And before we know it, we have lived a life long enough to see that our lives have been changed by Jesus and his word. There's a story of a man named Hort Schultz, who became a part owner of the business Ritz Carlton. I always knew the name Ritz as uh, the things in my life that weren't. Well, this is nice, but it sure isn't the Ritz. But Ritz, but Horst Schultz became known as the guy who trained his employees, all of the employees of Ritz Carlton, from the bottom up, 
by saying this, you are ladies and gentlemen who serve ladies and gentlemen. See, Horst Schulte said that because he didn't get his start by being the part owner of Ritz-Carlton. In fact, for many years before he was even a manager of anything, he spent late nights washing dishes, cleaning out ashtrays, and shiny shoes of guests. He did the small things over and over again until they were big things. And he embedded that into the culture of the business that's still one of the best in ho the hotel empire today. Maybe you wonder, what does this have to do with me? You might remember Joseph, the prince of Egypt, in the later chapters of Genesis. Well, before he was even known as the prince of Egypt, he was a slave for a few years, and then a prisoner for eight, all before Pharaoh even knew his name. Moses was herding sheep before he led the largest, one of the largest people groups to the edge of the promised land. God says, do not despise the days of small beginnings because he doesn't. Because even the smallest details, we can find him at work. He rejoices just to see us start. And so this morning, before we wrap up, what I want to do right now is I want us to remind us of a verse that we find uh, later in the Bible in Colossians. You see, Paul says this in Colossians, Obey your earthly masters. He's talking to slaves, but we can even take from this ourselves, just dealing with each other in our own lives. He says, Obey your earthly masters and do it not only when the eye is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart, as if you're working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving, not man. See, Paul is teaching uh, the Colossians this principle that whatever we do, whether they're big things or small things, whether they're taking care of daily responsibilities or they're larger things where everybody is looking to us, we have to remember that we are not working for the approval of man or anyone here on earth. We're doing this for the recognition of God because we are obeying him. I think it's important for us to define in life what success means and what it looks like. Uh, one pastor says that success is doing the best you can with what you have and where you are. Whether it's in financials, your, your finances, or your relationships, or, your, or it's your spiritual life, or it's your intellectual life, it's important to realize that success is doing the very best that we can with what we have where we are. It's doing the best with our finances right now, no matter what we have. We can all be obedient and steward the resources that we have, not just the resources that we want. We can steward the relationships that we have right now, Success in life, what does that mean to you when you look at your spouse? What does success look like? Does it look like being the most faithful husband or wife? Does it look like stewarding your relationship well by loving and honoring and respecting your spouse? What does it look like with your children to be the best parent and to be successful in your life as a parent? I think it's important that we define success. And one of the ways I think we define success is faithfulness. Eugene Peterson, one of my favorite authors and pastors, once said that really faithfulness and success 
is a long obedience in the same direction. It's living a life obedient to Christ one day at a time, over and over and over. I think one of the ways that we find that kind of successful life is by reclaiming the mundane. I think it's easy for us to overestimate what we can do in a year, but underestimate what we can do in 10. But in 10 years from now, it'll be made up of 10 365 day segments. And each of those days has a purpose. Each of those days will purposeful faithfulness for us. And that's flying the kite. Flying the kite is living each day with a purpose driven by God, full of the power of the Holy Spirit. And each of those days will hold mundane tasks, whether it's serving someone that you work with, or it's serving your neighbor, or it's cultivating a relationship with someone who doesn't know Christ. Those little things, even pouring coffee for your spouse, picking up a little card for someone that you work with and reminding them that you know what's going on and that you just care. They seem like the mundane, but those little things over and over will pour out into a life of faithful living. Flying the kite is simple. It's just starting. Flying the kite is just remembering that every little thing that we do, we don't do for our own recognition for our own notoriety, we do it so that more people will know Christ and that we can live a faithful life in Jesus right here, right now. One day we will look back on a life of faithfulness. Hopefully one day somebody will talk about us at our graveside or at our bedside about how faithful we are to Jesus. You know, when I think about what somebody might say many years down the line at my funeral, part of me would love for somebody to say, well, he was a great pastor. Oh, did he know a lot about the Bible? Oh, did he do such great things? But really what I hope and what I pray about my life and your life is that somebody will sit next to me or stand at my graveside and remember that I was faithful in the long haul. That my life will be made up of many days and each of those days began with a choice of faithfulness. That I chose every day to fly the kite that would one day lift up a banner with the name of Jesus. And that's what I pray for your life too. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Start right now. Do something that's faithful right now. Now, whatever it might be, God is calling us to some faithful task here and now. What is it? I hope today you will choose that task, that you'll fly the kite, and that you will live a faithful life in Jesus. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we are so thankful that you have, for many of us, called us out of the grave and given us a new life in you. And we pray that we would steward every moment of that life well. That we'd steward it faithfully. And that we'd be faithful to you over many years that starts at a single moment. But I pray that for many of us, we would seize the moment at hand full of the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us to do the right thing right now and do it again and again. Lord, we love you and we're so grateful for the life that we have in Jesus who gave himself up for us that you would love us enough that you'd give your son to die for us. And the spirit that lives inside of us that gives us 
power and life to live a life full of your grace and your power and your truth. And we thank you for all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.